4,484 miles from the States, the love's still the same. Whether you're from the country or the estate, the court is where we escape. From the big UK, where we see nothing but rain, but listen closely and you'll hear the ball swish through the chain. Nothing else is the same. We're really in love with this game. The playground is our stage. Three, two, one, we call game. It's all love, even if you come from another hood. Out here on the court, basketball is brotherhood. And don't think for a second, we ain't got love for the sisters too. It's non-stop vibes anytime you're with your crew. <laughs> the game's bigger than you think, from Scotland to London. We make it happen, even without government funding. It starts in the park, where we hoop till it's dark. Welcome to the UK's basketball brotherhood. Let's dance. Basketball, round here, that's a brotherhood. Brotherhood, sisterhood, whatever you want to call it. We're a family. If you got love for the game, we got love for you. Yeah, our relationship, so... We're my, cousins. Yeah, we're cousins. <laughs> We've known each other since we was like 10, 11. Eight years ago, we met each other for the first time, you know, love at first sight. <laughs> Both of our teams made it to the final, actually, so it was yeah. a really competitive game. We won! Uh. From him, my brother, looking up to it. Then me coming in to do it, and then yeah, you looking up to me yeah, doing yeah, it. it was nuts. And Tournaments, events, and in the summertime, it's always the party. It's always the parties. I wasn't good, and I was small, so they used to bully me around, push me around. Jam Jam was my teammate, yeah, and that was my first experience playing basketball and, and being on the team. Do you know what's funny? You might not even know, but like, when we was young, I probably used to look up to you for playing basketball. Yeah, we're now on the same team. And Jam went pro, mm -hmm. I did my thing. <laughs> <laughs> Three games a week, yeah, training every day, or just nuts. eat, breathe, sleep, just non-stop <clears> basketball, <throat> everything, and that's the grind of it, innit? Whilst the UK basketball family continues to chase their dreams, across the ocean, a star is rising and taking care of his family in the process. Zion, he's brilliant. He plays basketball how it's supposed to be played, so it's like a joy to watch him. He's a year or two younger than me, but I look up to him it's so crazy, much. You can do Zion because you got the I the list. With having so much pressure on him, pre pretty much the most pressure anyone's received since probably LeBron. He's a beast. Like I don't know how people try and stop him. But no, he's wicked. I don't know what he has in his knees or in his feet, man. <laughs> I would not be getting in his way. Like I'm just, right, take it to the hoop if you want to. He's going to be the face of the NBA in years to come. He's going to be an all-star. He's going to be player. generational talent for sure. Great, great player. Next one to watch. Consensus number one pick in the NBA draft, taking the league by storm. A dominant force that's putting up stat lights we haven't seen in generations. Zion makes it look easy, but it wasn't always as easy as he might make it look. Really? I just wanted people to know me. Rise and grind. From the age of nine, every day at 5 a.m., only one thing was on Zion's mind. Motivated to create a better life for his brothers, he hit the court and learned the game from his mother. It's those early mornings that lead to success, then his stepfather helped him refine his game and add some finesse. I'm excited. This, this is what it's all about. Uh, what we do on the court, and I'm, I'm hyped about it. 
The journey through the struggle is one that the UK basketball community is all too familiar with. No one becomes great by accident, they've got to put in the work. Here in London, it's a road filled with obstacles, but those who have reached the heights of the big league are now trying to give back to their communities. You've got to have some fundamentals, you've got to have some core beliefs, and basketball to me gives an opportunity to show those and to teach those to the kids. Well, first of all, I'm from uh, South London. I went to Tulse Hill, small community of Jamaicans who came over. There wasn't that much diversity except when I went to school. Notorious school, cricket team, football team, no basketball team, by the way. We did everything else in between. I was sitting in the playground one day and my PE teacher knocked me on the shoulder and said, listen, come inside, I've got, I've got a game for you, basketball. Anyway, I went inside the gym. And one of my friends were there, went in there, started playing him and he thrashed me. He was doing stuff I didn't, I didn't know what was going on, but I knew that I liked the game. The next few weeks I went to the gym. Every break time, after school, just kept playing and playing. About a month later, I challenged him to a duel, so to speak, and I thrashed him. And my PE teacher was there, and he was like, oh, you've, you've really improved since the last time I saw you. He sent me down to Crystal Palace, and that's where it really started for me. Roy Packham, great man, developed lots of players, great reputation, tapped me on the shoulder like they always do, I said, would you fancy going to America? Obviously, I said yes. So now being plunked in a private school was definitely a shock to the system. And I think I was able to succeed because of my athleticism, my prowess. I had no idea about the NBA, if you really want to know the truth. Until I went to America, I didn't know much about it. There wasn't much exposure over here. When I went to the States, all of a sudden, it was thrust in your face. Every day, you know, during the season, commercials, guys are on TV doing marketing stuff. I thought it was way beyond me. I knew how vast and big America was, so I'm like, I'm just this one guy, I don't really think I'm gonna make it, but you know what, I'm gonna enjoy my journey. As the years went on, I started to get more accolades and, and do more things on the court. It started to become kind of a dream that, you know what, you might actually be good enough. I mean, I used to watch the Boston Celtics against the Lakers. That's my era, Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. And I used to sit in my dorm room, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, underneath the sheets, with a small TV, watching these games. And that's where I really started to dream that this is some place I'd love to be. You know, I went to North Carolina, so we were pretty up there. But the NBA was another level. We used to take a private jet to all the games. I mean, you should just hand your bag to somebody and it'll end up in your hotel room. I've never seen anything like it. I think people don't understand that next step from college to the NBA is a huge step because you get really the best of the best. And the Lakers were at the time, they still had some of the best players around. Being able to watch them operate every day in and out was an experience that, you know, I, I, would, I could never replace it. Teamwork is very important to us. Working together. Discipline. Listening to your coaches. These things people don't talk about when you see the NBA players. They're foundation to their success. My stepfather is the one that taught me the game of basketball. He Man, our relationship goes beyond basketball. He taught me how to carry myself as a man. Uh, how do I get there? What are some of the pitfalls? You know, what level of intensity do I need to be working? Without knowing that, how, how can you, you know, plan your trajectory? How can you do that? I was nine. The coach came to me and said, you know, Z, I had a dream last night. It was 18, 19, and me and you were in the green room with your mom, and the commissioner walked out there and called your name number one. The New Orleans Pelicans select Zion Williamson from Duke University. I dreamed about this since I was four. And for it to actually happen, I just thank God for it. We did it, bro. We did it, bro. I, I wouldn't be here without my mom. She put her dreams aside for mine. And sure enough, it happened. I, I, I've seen somebody who believed in the process, who put in the work, and who, um, you know, put those naysayers aside and just continue to do what we ask and continue to believe in the process. And because of that, we're here today. To this day, she is the hardest coach I've ever had. Nobody believes when I say that, but she is the hardest coach. A good game in her books is, nah, like, no. Nah. It's, it's hard to get a good game in her books. So I've tried to bring that mentality here, really that do or die mentality, I think that you have in the States. That's what I noticed. Guys were playing for their, their lives, so to speak. You know, little did I know at that time, she was only preparing me for a future that 
I didn't even see for myself. Guys were playing to get out of their environment. They were playing for everything, a scholarship to college. So it was very fierce. Just the desire of, no matter what happens in life, like good or bad, if I set my mind to something, I feel like I can do it. So I think that's the first thing we need to create some aspirations to play in our professional league. My name is Justin Robinson, 33 years old, from Brixton, South London. Been playing basketball about 25 years. <laughs> My older brother, he, he bought me like a, a Michael Jordan poster, like that, just randomly for uh, Christmas. I just started playing on my estate, you know, playing with some friends, you know, like shooting against a wall, you know, like makeshift baskets, kind of like driving everyone in the area crazy, you know, bouncing the ball. My dad took me to Bricks and Top Cats. And, you know, that's where I first met Jimmy Rogers and Jabbar Kasim. And, you know, I was kind of introduced to that whole community, playing on the 16s, on the 18s, men's. And just, you know, step by step, just kind of improving as a player, as a person. At the age of 16, I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship. You know, went to the States, I did three years of high school, four years of university, and then came back, played Europe, like seven years, and then Last four years, I've been back in the BBO in the UK. I just see myself as, as Justin. Like, I, I don't really get involved in the whole hoopla, you know, BBO, MVP, all this stuff. I am those kids, you know. I've come up in the same estates. I've gone through the same trauma, the same trial and tribulation as them. Um, so, you know, I can relate to them. You know, they relate to me and they, you know, they can open up to me. You can see that the culture is so rich in terms of content creators, in terms of players, in terms of organisations and how much it means to the community. Basketball is able to be successful to understand because of the exposure. In terms of like it reaching the wider audience, you've got the whole social media. There's people now that have never played and they, you know, they've seen games on Sky Sports, on YouTube, or their kids have you know, requested to go to a game. And I just, I just think now it's reaching the wider audience, you know. Not everyone can rain threes or catch alley-oops, but basketball influences even those who took a different route. We all look up to the stars of the league, whether it be point guards or centres. So we caught up with Harry Pinero, the UK's most popping presenter. I think 2009-2010, people were starting to wear Jordans. The ones that we was getting over here weren't the, the lit ones, you know. You'd see it on all the rappers, you see it on the basketball players. I was thinking, now nah, we can't get those. And I saw my friend with a Jordan 4s and I was like, yo, those trainers are beautiful. I need those. I remember saving up my money um, that my mum gave me for my birthday and I ended up buying them. Then with basketball 2012 Olympics, when America came over here and absolutely dominated the sport, LeBron James, Kobe. And I had a deep love for Westbrook because I just thought he was just an outlaw, the one that was the underdog but was so sick. The sport started getting more popular. It started becoming a culture as the UK started adopting the American culture of wearing the trainers normally now. We've infused that culture in it, so now I'm part of it. I've seen the ball so I can be like that while we're talking. Yeah. Initially when we flew out to LA, my cameraman was like, if we're going out there, I'm definitely going to go see a Lakers game. Bro, you can't come to LA and not see the Lakers. Ah, oh, man, I should go, so I went, okay, let's go. So we went over to the Staples Center. I didn't know that my seats were so low. Like, it was, I was so close. And I was behind the bench of the Pelicans and I could hear them seeing Zion and this is the first time I ever got to see him. When you get to watch a basketball game live, and the atmosphere, it's a whole different thing. I can't compare it to any other sport. Mad, beautiful. When you see LeBron come through and you see the way the Lakers fans are appreciative of him, bro. But you could definitely see like, you know, Zion's hunger to want to be one of the best, the, the teacher and, and the student on the, on, on, the, on the court. But you could definitely see that Zion, I think he scored like 20 something points. To score that against a, a strong Lakers team, which ended up winning the, the championship. It was sick, a beautiful moment. My name is Ed Lucas, I'm from London. I've been playing basketball since I was six years old and it's my passion, man. I love, you know, UK, it's all about football. I started playing football first, I got kicked off my team because I actually started playing basketball as well. So like, it was a shaky start at first because I didn't really know what I was getting into. Um, I watched one movie, Space Jam, that kind of like, you know, made me want to keep pursuing basketball. Obviously, I can't dunk like Michael Jordan, I can't stretch my arm from half court or anything like that, but that's what really like set off my love for, for basketball. And the community wasn't really big. My older brother liked to kind of find places to play, start making our connections, but I didn't really play for like a team. I didn't know that was a thing over here in England, so I was like just mainly street ball. You know, after school, my friends and all that stuff. And then um, one of my close friends in year eight, Arnold, he um, told me to come play for Kingston Wildcats. And I was like, right, they, they got teams here. So I went from Kingston Wildcats, London Towers, Brixton Topcats, and I think I just had like a good foundation of basketball 
basketball with me already and it kind of just set me off for like greater things in life. Literally from when I first picked up the basketball man like I kind of had like a natural kind of feel for it. I was always able to kind of shoot, couldn't dribble to save my life but I knew if I keep working on it I'll be able to be an all-round player. You know like in my culture it's not really a thing for guys to be like sportsmen. It's all about doctors, lawyers, all that kind of thing but my closest like relationships have all been basketball. It just built that connection and like I'm thankful for the the guys I've met along the way, not just in London, like overseas. I've got like a big network of people now that I can rely on. So the whole Last Dance thing, I remember, I think it was during the pandemic when it kind of got released. So everyone was at home and you kind of had no option but to watch it. Even like watching like The Last Dance as well, I think like that's opened up a lot of people's eyes to how beautiful the sport is. It's brilliant and I I'm loved it. I'm here for it, yeah, I'm here for because it. Because it, it adds a whole new world of conversation that was never there before. It was about, you know, the old Chicago Bulls team, Michael Jordan and stuff. A lot of my friends are coming and talking to me like, oh, do you know, I didn't even know basketball was this technical. Exposure for a lot more people to get into the game of basketball as well and had that uh, way of exploring the sport. You got to know the history of the game to know where you're going. You got to know your history. So these old timers like myself, we can tell you when we had to travel in the back of buses with chickens playing for England. You actually resonate with it a lot more than you, than you thought. So these stories are good to have to know where you're going and where we're trying to reach. I feel like in comparison to a lot of sports, yeah, basketball is a, it's a freedom. You see the way the players play, the style, the trash talk, it's lit. It's lit, lit, lit. I think the sport has a personality that is like no other sport. I think a lot of people, not even being connected to the sport, actually have some sort of affiliation with basketball, whether it's through their style, their shoes, what they wear. It's the culture, man. The sneakers, the fashion. People are starting to see that basketball is cool. A lot of people play basketball because it's fashionable. The athletes, they wear the fancy clothes and new trainers and that attracts the kids. I think it's huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's undeniably huge, especially when a couple of years ago and them changing the laws with the colorways that you could wear. For the first time in league history. And guys wear whatever they want. Guys could tell different stories. That opened up the floodgates for you'd see a lot more players wear something different or try experiment with customs or being able to wear yeah, any yeah, different yeah, colorways yeah. and stuff like that. The NBA is really allowing the guys to be the most expressive out of any league we've seen and giving their guys the freedom to wear whatever they want. You know, as a kid, you you kind of just say it just to put it in the atmosphere that, yeah, I want my own shoe when I get older. So my name is Jared Mann. My name is Kelsey Amy. My name is Peter Catrillis. I'm the product director for Jordan Sport. Senior color designer with Jordan Brand. Senior design director for Jordan Men's Apparel. What we always try to do is come in with a really open mind and listen first. Bring colorways to life, bring stories to life on footwear. No, this is... I don't even think it's hit me yet still. It was an 18 month process, which a lot of people also don't realize, like how long it truly takes to bring a shoe to life. You know, I, I was in a lot of Zoom calls. You know, 19 year old kid who doesn't want to be stuck on a Zoom call all day, right? During those Zoom calls, I would just kind of sit there and kind of like get lost in thought. And I would just be thinking, man, I'm in a Zoom call right now about getting my own sneaker. That's crazy. So one of the projects we gave to him was create a little mood board. Like, you know, we've all done in, in high school where we got to kind of come up with a project. And what are some of your favorite shoes? What are some of the things that you like about those shoes? When you wake up in the morning, how do you get dressed? Do you start with your outfit, do you start with your shoes. What do you like to match the mismatch Noah and Zion and his mom went and they worked on this mood board. He wanted them to have an opinion. And I think that was really unique to him. Insights from him, from how he plays the game of basketball. He had played in the PG ones, Kyrie threes, fours. He may not inherently tell us, but we knew what those shoes represented. We quickly realized like he's such a humble guy. He's so down to earth. He's all about his family. He's all about his friends, all about that hard work that he put in. We really wanted to do that some justice, really just highlighting who he is as a person. And so this colorway is really an embodiment of that idea. And as you see the pink in it, which represents the, the lotus flower. It's actually planted in the mud and it has to go through all kinds of obstructions in order to get to the surface of the water. It just blossoms, it blooms. We thought that the Lotus was actually an amazing representation just kind of of his story, not only as a human being, but as an athlete as well. Ball is life. I know you've heard the saying, basketball has an influence even when we're not playing. It's all we ever think about. It's always on our mind and it even filters into what we do while our bodies recover from the grind. So for those who don't know, Zion is a huge anime fan. I really got into anime when I was younger. And then I started watching the anime and started seeing that there was a deeper meaning to it and that like what they're visually showing us, 
human beings wouldn't be able to, to be able to do that. So it has to be an animation form. No matter which anime it was, the main character or even the side characters, no matter what they were going through in life, no matter the adversity they face. Storylines about life, about the struggles, about actually fighting for things, having a reason to live for. Their mindset was always, we can battle through it and we're gonna make the most of this and we're still gonna achieve our dream. If anyone's watched from the real, they understand that it's a, it's a journey of life about loyalty, family. And I think anyone who watches anime who's deeply involved in it has that, that, that connection to it. it. It is one of those things that once you watch it, you're, you're deep in. So if you know, you know, man. You know, the real for life. Rest in peace, Jiraiya. <laughs> <laughs> and it, you know, it was just something about that when I was a kid, you know, looking around in my environment, like, you know what? I say I'm gonna be in the NBA and uh, I'm gonna do it. Like, I don't care what nobody says. I'm gonna work hard towards my goal and I'm gonna, I'm gonna achieve it. First time I put my signature shoe on um, was in the locker room, Pelicans practice facility. Uh, Big Shot came to the locker room and said, uh, yeah, Jordan Rand wants you to wear test these. And, you know, he said it so casual, but me, I'm looking like, Big Shot, that's my first sneaker. Like, let me see those. I think it took me about 10 to 15 minutes before I actually kind of put them on. I just kind of sat in front of my locker, just kind of procrastinating, just because I wanted to look at them like, man, like, I'm really about to put these on. So when I did, I mean, it was, it was surreal. Compared to the US, the UK still has a long way to go, but the community is building. Every day it continues to grow. Young stars are starting to shine and you're starting to see the glow. We've overcome obstacles and can see more greatness as we travel down this road. We've always felt like we're on the verge of exploding in this country, right, the basketball. But for some reason, we just haven't got there. Like growing up, there wasn't a lot of things kind of like focusing on the communities I grew up in. And now, like obviously everyone sees that my community is the one that plays a lot more in the basketball. And there's a lot of kids, a lot of adults even like involved in it. What I want to see is a representation. We're trying to reimagine the sport. And to me, that means we're, we're going to Try to be the face of the participants. Try to be the face of the people. You know, we need people that have come up, you know, through the system, that have played basketball at a high level, you know, that can relate to these kids, that we know what these kids need. Some new, younger players who want to play the game. New, younger ideas that may come into the game and help. You can't really relate or tell someone what to do if you've never been in their shoes, you know. I definitely think we need people that look like us in terms of black or minorities that are at the top. And I think that that's where the, the major disconnect is, you know. We've got people in place that probably never even play basketball. We need people in, in power that know what they're doing. Eventually, I think you need resources, don't you? Resources and exposure. We have to demand more. It's been a while, but we've got a lot more players playing in, in high caliber leagues. And they've got to continue to do that to bring the exposure here. I think it just takes that like, one person or even a group of people just investing it properly without the fear of like maybe it not getting to what they expect it to be, but just kind of go like both feet in and just kind of take it to places never been. You can create friends for life. You come into a gym, um, you don't know anybody. Five minutes later, you're best buddies. Five minutes later, you could be diving for a loose ball together. Five minutes later, you could be high-fiving. It is that kind of brotherhood. Something about, even when I was there, with my two best friends t telling each other, no matter what happens, we're gonna make it out of here. We're gonna, we're gonna achieve our we're dreams. Gonna achieve our dreams.